This saw the birth of Australia's first counterculture surf movement. As surf culture exploded in the 60s, surfers were made to pay to surf. If you couldn't afford the board registration, you were in effect unable to surf. The surfers' invasion of the beaches was deplored and seen in much the same strain as farmers deplored the invasion of their paddocks by grasshoppers. But the most ridiculous law to keep them off the beaches was when the authorities made surfers wear skirts while in the surf. The ludicrous nature of the law required an equally ludicrous response. Thousands of larrikin surfers turned up to the beach in skirts, bonnets and bows and within weeks the law was dropped. This is the same larrikin attitude that perhaps is still at the heart of the conflict today. The Aussie surf culture has always had larrikin characters in it, you know, like I guess when we were growing up, like, maybe it was different to it than a lot of beaches, but we didn't have, like, a lot of money, you know? Not many of the people did back then, so... We would just find stuff to do to keep ourselves entertained, you know? Just writing off, and there's no way. Pushing social boundaries is not really new to the boys. It's that same carefree, perhaps careless attitude that sees the boys push the boundaries in the surf. You know, there's just nothing better than being with your brothers and your friends and all psyching each other up to see who's going to charge the hardest. It's how we first came about surfing a break, which was supposed to be unsurfable. In early 2003, we had heard rumours of a wave in Botany Bay, which broke right in front of the cliff face, and it only worked on really big swells. It was that, that crazy of a wave, and we just used to watch it. You know, people call me like a wuss and that, but I never really thought of surfing it. And it was just too close to the rocks. It was a good wave to watch, but I'd never thought it'd ever get surfed. And then I saw photos of the guys like Kobe and that riding it. And, um, but those guys are just crazy, so it doesn't surprise me. The wave's just one headland across from us. After checking it out, it looked pretty good. So we named it ours. Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep.
guys on the on the rocks just cheering, you know, like fucking everyone hanging out, having lunch, just like cheering the boys. It's just like shift after shift, like we'll surf it, come in, the other boys are out there going mad. And then we get back out there and it's just all day, it's just crazy surf. Charging it so hard that like, everyone was wiping out, but no one knew how how you know how hard you could push it before you get washed over the rocks. Without a doubt, Richie Bass. Without a doubt, that kid got this one. It's probably the heaviest one that I've ever seen in my life. I was falling and I fell backwards and twisted around. Sort of knocked all the wind out of me and I hurt my shoulder and I bruised all my ribs and you know, I got sucked back over and bounced across the reef. I'm just gonna roll around me, I think my nose me board just jab me in the neck. Six dig scars. Six dig scars. Yeah, go up again. Six dig scars. Oh, it's there, there. Is that the shot? Yeah, it's the shot. Go, keep your head down. <laughs> <laughs> my mum let me have the day off school so I could come and surf here. Yeah. Good opportunity. Dress. Dress. Yeah, it was fun out there. Is that your first time surfing out? Uh, no, my second, but. They're the first time I've got barrels and that. Yeah. Oh. Fucking hope I was nervous. I was shit myself. Got that drilled, hit the rock and that, touch the bottom. The boys make it heaps better too. Because they suck you up more, maybe they just call you into it. Out here with Kobe and the boys fixing it up. Yeah, it's sick being with Kobe and that. They give you the good way. That's good. We take the younger guys away on trips and try and push them in the surf because that's exactly what the older guys did for me, Jai and Kobe, and our other friends who were growing up. And without that, we would have never have found a life of surfing. So we're, we're trying to pass that back down to the next generation. Jess comes from a you know, housing commission background and he's hungry to do good for himself. I've taken him away on some trips and he's charged as hard as he possibly could every time. Yeah, we just watch the swell maps and if we see a big swell coming, I just ring up Jess and ring his mum and dad and say, Porky, Debbie, we're going here or there. Jess is coming. And they say, no, 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 and I say, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Every time we go away, Kobe's got a rule, like, if you don't charge, you've got to get your own way home. The whole point of me taking away on the trips is just letting them have the life that I've had. It's, there's nothing like it. You can earn massive money and do something you love. I picked him because he's respectful and he wants to do it. He doesn't sit back and, and you know, run up our reputations. He wants to make his own name for himself. The only reason I do go on trips with Kobe is because I'm focused and he's already told me that if I 
play out, but he won't take me away. Because Kobe's paying for me to take me away, and that I don't want to let him down. The surf has saved so many kids around here, you know, and, and led them to a lifestyle in the ocean instead of a lifestyle in crime. Maroo Beach um, has definitely been mums and dads to so many kids in Maroo. I mean, you go down there and you know you're going to be taken care of. Um, any kid can come down there and in a strange way, River Beach will take care of you. Yeah, I had my doubts, first of all. I was worried about the drug situations and all the fights and all this, with all this gang talk. But no, I'm not at all, not at all. I'm not one frightened, not one bit scared of my son hanging with the boys. Confident in it, it's great. Oh, only when he first started hanging down here, I didn't really know what to expect. He was so young, and then there was the grummy treatment. I'd come down and Joel would be tied up screaming, Ma! <laughs> you know, tied to Jesse or something, mate, eating dog poo, <laughs> and things like this, or he'd be holed up in a phone box. And uh, then I got to know everyone, and I have no issues whatsoever. As Deb said, they treat them with respect, the kids. They look after them. And um, I think his life is down here. Joel just loves it. There's always been a sense of mistrust with the police in the area. There's a lack of communication between the two. And inevitably, some of the younger kids get targeted by the police. This inevitably leads into them receiving small fines for things like loitering, which can stack up quite heavily while they're in their mid-teen years. What happened, boy? Busted. <laughs> in Australia, the fines are built into the driver's licence system. So by the age of 16, these kids can owe two or $3,000 in fines. What that means is that they're prevented from getting a driver's licence precisely the time that they need one to become a fruitful member of society. I was only 13 or 14 and I was trying to sell ecstasy pills and a guy put a gun down my throat and I still didn't give it up, so I put, basically put my life in front of those tablets. I started stealing, breaking into houses and that, my, to sort of support my habit type thing. Started using other drugs like ecstasy, cocaine, stuff like that. Stopped surfing, stopped training, stopped football. I used to play rep football and that. But now it's just all gone downhill sort of thing and then ended up in juvie, juvenile justice centre sort of thing. And just, when you're in there you get locked down in a cage like six hours a day. Was there a message from the older guys? Yeah, there down was. The um, can't smoke. Stop. Don't take drugs. Um, just surf. Just you know, train. Get fit. Did they you think know, you were going to end up in jail? Lots of them said that to me. Yeah, lots of the boys said you watch out. You know, you're gonna. You're only gonna go one place. You know, a few of the boys had already been there. You know, they they've done that. When you get back out into the community, it's sort of like, it's sort of like um. You know, it's just, I don't know, it's just weird and it's like, you don't fit in sort of thing, you know, because you're used to being inside and that, and it's just not the way to be, man. It's no life to live at all. How old are you now? I'm only 15, just turned 15. There's always been a fork in the road for youth growing up in Maroubra. It's no different for today's generation. They can either choose a path to glory through the ocean or a path to destruction and fall off the rails. Being a local member of the community for over 30 years, I saw a lot of the older crew who got into crime end up in Long Bay Jail, which was practically in our backyards. In particular, a violent standover character by the name of Anthony Hines, who I knew from his early teenage years. Hinesy ended serving five years for rape. After Tony served his time, he triggered a series of devastating events that would change the course of the lives of the Abaddon family, who I also knew since they were kids. Hinesy was always dark. There's always something dark and brooding about Tony, and, uh, he was OK to talk to one-on-one, -on -one and but he was just on another planet as far as he's in the community but not really part of it. He had his own thing happening in his head. 
and it certainly wasn't to uh, do good by people. Tony Hines had something in his mind about Jai and two other blokes having slept with his, his girlfriend. Out of the three guys that Hines had this obsession with, he wanted to get revenge. One of the guys is now dead. Another guy has been bashed within an inch of his life and his sanity he was that battered around the head by Hines. And thirdly, Jai was the next guy in line. Uh, that seemed to be Hines' plan. Well, what you've got to realise was, <laughs> Tony was a really good friend of mine since a young age, you know. For me, I was feeling that uh, such a good, close friend put me in a situation like that. Hines, he just followed them up to this girl's car and told Jai to get in the back. The girl drove off with Hines in the front seat. Hines pulled a gun, put it behind his head and whispered to Jai, we're going to do this. What Jai knew Hines meant by we're going to do this was to rape that girl in the car. The gun came out, Jai just acted instinctively, grabbed the gun, it went off as they were grappling with the gun. Jai just said he shut his, his eyes and just kept that, that, uh, that trigger squeezed. Stained drag marks led police to Mistral Point at Maroubra. 20 metres below the cliff, they found the naked body of 37-year-old standover man, Tony Hines. Kobe's older brother, Jai Abberton, has been charged with the murder. When we first found out about Jai getting arrested after the murder, we just, just didn't know how to act, you know. It was just that uncertainty of what to do next, you know, what now? How is this going to affect our lives and will our lives ever be the same again? Six months into Jai's incarceration, Kobe was arrested by police for refusing to assist with the investigation. He was charged with accessory to murder after the fact, hindering a police investigation and attempting to pervert the course of justice. When Kobe was arrested as well, I think it just put, it made me feel totally just numb, you know, like it was incomprehensible to, to lose two brothers, to maybe lose two brothers to a prison cell for the rest of their lives. But I think it was, it made the whole community feel numb, the whole extended family, you know. Kobe faces the Supreme Court and is granted bail just days before an international surfing contest at Maruba Beach. When Kobe was released three days before the pro contest and he drew Kelly Slater in his first heat, the whole atmosphere, the whole tension in the beach, it was just, it was electrifying, you know? Here was his chance to say, you want to have a go at me? You want to take my livelihood away? You want to lock me behind bars? Well, give it your best shot. The sponsors tried to pull his wild card. His own sponsors threatened to dump him, but he was at his home beach in front of all of his friends and the people who mattered, surfing against the world champion. This was it. This was game on. Who's going to win? Kelly Kobe. or Kobe? Kobe. Kelly or Kobe? Kobe. I had a funny, a funny feeling when I came down for the Snickers contest because I don't remember exactly what people were saying, but it was just, you know, like, Kobe's going to kick your ass and all this stuff. And, and, um, and um, you know, I'm almost turning around going, yeah, well, fuck you too, you know? And the Kobe's just, like, laughing, but at the same time he's kind of serious because he wants to beat me in the heat. And it, it's just a funny little scene. 